Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 16th episode of the PEM podcast, the Psychic Eye Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Laurie, with my fabulous sister, my beautiful, beautiful, fabulous sister, Sandy. Um, and this week we've got um, kind of a... Um, it's really kind of a sad tale. And I think it's a sad tale, not just for the story, because this woman is such a bright, beautiful light, but also because in my digging into like what happened, there isn't really a resolution. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it's, it's a little bit on the nebulous side and it's a little frustrating from one perspective. There is a little bit of hope, um, a little bit of light that comes in as well when I dug in and um, kind of got the scoop from the other side. So um Hopefully it won't be too much of a bummer. <laughs> Welcome to the next hour where you will be <laughs> weeping. And depressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. We are though, um, we're going to do, Sandy and I are already planning in a couple of weeks to do, because um, I'll be in Hawaii. I know, you're, I know, I know, I know. I wish I could take all of you with me, especially you, Sands. But you and I are, we'll go in December. Okay. I feel it. I know we're going to okay. do that. Um so um, from Hawaii, we'll be doing <clears throat> a recording and we just want to do something fun. So we're um, plotting something uh, for that particular episode. So it's not going to be all doom and gloom and sadness and depression. It's going to be about killer sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever tell you this story? Okay. I'm segwaying. Oh God, here we okay. go. So I was in Florida with some friends and it was right on the Gulf. Uh, we were in this condominium complex. It was right on the Gulf. And um, we were, you know, told do not swim in the water because of the jellyfish, and um, um, that there there were some sharks. Um, uh, I forget what they're called. The, they're like the sharks that kind of are, stick close to the tiger sharks. Shallows, not tigers. No, no, no. Um, I can't remember what kind of shark they were. Anyway, um, uh, they come out at dawn and dusk, and they are kind of the most responsible for shark attacks, quote unquote, shark attacks in Florida. Anyway, so um, I'm sitting in this lawn chair with my friend and we're looking at the beautiful coast, or excuse me, the Gulf, uh, the um, Gulf, and um, a fin comes out of the water and um, starts moving along very close to shore. And I'm pointing and I go, yeah. like I'm screaming shark, right? And then all of a sudden <laughs> goes the blowhole, it's a dolphin. <laughs> Oh no, that's hilarious. <laughs> Super dangerous dolphin. Fin I know, big. right? Look so look for the double fin, right? Yeah. If you only see one fin, yeah, that's just a dolphin. If you see the, or a blowhole, it's a dolphin. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was, um, my friend turned to me and she's like drama queen. <laughs> <laughs> like she knows you. I'm like what? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, so. Time for a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> and a coconut, please bring me. I think that's what I'm going to do in Hawaii. I'm just going to get a coconut, you know, kind of empty out the inside and just walk around and be like, here, fill me up with rum and deliciousness. <laughs> I'm sure people will be lining up to fill up that coconut. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make it rain. I'll make it rain. <laughs> fill it up. Fill it up. <laughs> Here's your souvenir coconut, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody want to touch that after a week. That's for sure. Okay, so um, let's talk um, featured book. Doo, 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 doo. It's another Abby Cooper. Um, there's a lot of books in the series, so that's why we're doing Thank mostly goodness. Abby. Yeah, mostly Abby Cooper. Um, so this is Killer Insight. Um, and where are my glasses? Okay. Um, so I'll just read the back of the cover because it's just easier. Um, when a relationship with FBI agent Dutch Rivers skids to a halt, Abby Cooper is fully aware that a wedding isn't the best uh, post-breakup scenario. But when a friend from the Mile High City finds herself short one bridesmaid, it doesn't take a professional psychic to see the opportunity for a much needed getaway. High altitudes can be healing and Abby reunites with friends, especially her childhood crush, Duffy McGinnis. Um, now who's now the town sheriff, not to mention tall, dark, and yummy. Um, but Abby needs more than a shoulder to cry on. One bridesmaid after another is mysteriously flying the coop, and Abby's intuition tells her their final destinations aren't pretty. With the wedding party uh, falling apart and her gift of sight never quite so foggy, Abby has to save the date and herself from becoming the next taffeta-clad target. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's actually what? a very enjoyable read. I really like this book. I, I I'm not going to declare it as my favorite because apparently I'm <laughs> accused of declaring all of them my favorite. But it was I did the favorite of the year book. that it came out. That's right? true. The yes. favorite of the year that it came out. Um, yeah. Um, this was, um, you know, some of the some of them, some of the books just kind of fly. Writing them is just fairly easy, and some really take a lot of work. Um, the one that I'm writing right now, actually, I'm, I can't wait to get back to the computer because it's just, whew, it's flying. This one I remember was a little painful. Um, it just, um, sometimes it just doesn't want to come together the way you want it to come together. And you have to spend a lot of time figuring out why and fixing it. So, um, uh, but I, 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 I did like my ending, so. It's a good book. It's a good read. You wouldn't know there was pain in developing it because it is a lot of fun to read. Well, thank so. you. Thank you, yes. honey. Thank you. Um, okay. So next up anecdotes. Okay. So here's the thing. It's been really, really interesting the past, I would say two weeks because, uh, I can see the mediumship has taken a turn and it's become more immersive in a way. So last week, um, I told, I talked about the anecdote with the, uh, Czech soldier, um, in world war II stuck in the trench, <clears throat> barely escaped with his life. Right. This week, I had two very similar experiences. So what's different about that particular kind of reading is that um, it's as if I'm looking out from that person's eyes. So in other words, as I was trying to explain to my sister, um, it's like um, when you break the, what is it, the third bail, the third wall in movies where someone addresses the camera as if that's the character, right? So um, I don't feel any of the fear, but I'm aware of the fear. I don't have a sense of like, oh, this is terrible. Get me out of this. It's more like, wow, this is, this is interesting. This is fascinating. So um, the first anecdote I read for a gentleman right after our podcast, actually, uh, last week, <laughs> this poor man, I thought I had cleared my schedule, you guys. So I have, I have missed one reading, one, one reading in 20 one years, 22 years, 22 years. He was my second. <laughs> so I thought I had cleared my schedule. The poor man, you know, was like waiting on Zoom and he's waiting and he's waiting. And I'm watching a movie, da, 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 you know, eating popcorn, having a good time. And then I just happened to glance at my phone and it was like, so-and-so has joined your Zoom meeting. And I'm like, oh. so um, he was so understanding. He was such a delight as a client, just really open, had never been read before. So it was a lot of like, you know, Bambi and headlights, like, wow, 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 kind of thing, which was, which I love, you know, I love like, pew, 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 <clears throat> um, spitting out some stuff. Um, anyway, so his, I told him, listen, have no expectations about who comes through. I have no control over it. Typically it's um, the person who needs to come through will come through, right? Well, thank God the person he wanted to come through was the person who came through. So his grandmother comes through and um, he had, a, I think, I believe he had a German last name. And so um, this was his grandmother on his mother's side. And um, she very, very clearly showed me that she had traveled from the UK. I, I'm pretty sure it was Ireland. I can't quite remember the detail, but um, I believe from Ireland to New York. And um, she'd come by boat. And so um, I'm kind of in her um, viewpoint. So I'm kind of watching through her eyes and I can see the Statue of Liberty um, and everybody's excited, but she's not, she's overwhelmed. There's so much stuff going on. And then she's <clears throat> on Ellis Island and everyone around her is speaking like a different either dialect of English that she can't understand because she's Irish. And if you ever go to Ireland and listen for a minute and a half, you will understand what I'm talking about because we're both speaking English, but we are speaking in very different ways. Um, and um, uh, she's nervous. She's afraid because her parents are afraid um, and her parents are afraid that they won't be let in. And um, the person who is checking people in felt to her to be someone who she was wary of. So this is a person like the gatekeeper, you know, the, the I don't know, guard or whatever, right? Who was checking people in. And um, so I asked my client, I said, did your grandmother come from Ireland and, and come through Ellis Island? And he said, yeah. And I said, was she like between 10 and 14? Because she was 12. 
I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, that was a really traumatic experience for him, for her. And he was like, that surprised him. Um, because I think he'd only heard the story told that grandmother came from Ireland through Ellis Island. I don't think he, he, I don't think she ever conveyed how traumatic it was, but I could feel her 12 year old self being very afraid of the whole experience. And just like, she was in a land she didn't recognize among people she didn't recognize speaking languages she didn't recognize. And it was really just over overwhelming and kind of traumatic for her. And, um, Everybody was dressed in like 1930s um, attire, which I thought was also really interesting. Um, uh, so, you know, just kind of a fascinating sort of reading from that perspective. And the reason it was so memorable, not only was because of the imagery, but because I had this immersive sort of experience seeing through this spirit's eyes at that particular, particular event. So that was twice in basically a week's time period. Well, then... Um, was it last night? Might have been last night. Um, yeah, it was. It was last night. I have a client that I've read for literally years. Like we're talking maybe eight, nine, ten years, once or twice a year at least. And I had always believed that she lived in the Philippines. I'd always just thought, okay, this client um, is Filipino and she lives in the Philippines. So um, it's the first time I've done any mediumship work for her. And um, um, older women, older woman steps forward immediately. And she felt kind of high in the hierarchy. So I asked my client, is your grandmother still here? Or she crossed and she said, she's still here. And I said, well, then this is your grandmother's mother who's stepping forward. And so this woman um, showed me again, a childhood experience where she was running through Hong Kong with her family, um, running for the boats. And I felt strongly that they were running for their lives. Um, and it had to do with um, the cleansing that Mao was going through at the time. So he was not necessarily newly minted in power, but this is where he was really exerting the influence of re-education, okay, in China. And um, her parents felt uh, educated, uh, so they would have been targets. So <clears throat> um, they're fleeing Hong Kong. And um, I could smell, they're at the harbor, that the they're at the... Um, the, the wharf or the harbor, and I could smell like the, that briny smell. And uh, the streets were like slick with um, dampness or rain or just waste, honestly. Um, and it was just a really uh, sensory kind of experience. And so I asked my client, I said, did your great grandmother come from China? And she said, yes. And I said, so she came to the Philippines? She said, no, Sing Singapore. I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense then. So, um, so that was the first time I really recognized that my client lived in Singapore. Um, but um, so these immersive kind of experiences are now kind of becoming sort of commonplace for me. And I absolutely love them because I think they're so freaking cool. I don't experience any of the, like I said, I, I don't personally experience any of the um, emotions, no fear, no pain. Um, even the, the gentleman that I talked about that one time where, um, he was showing me the scar tissue on his shoulder and, um, and then he showed me flames like right in front of my eyes. Um, that was more of a, Oh, that's interesting. That's cool. than a, you know, kind of thing. Um, there's a detachment that happens, but yet you are aware of all of the emotions that that particular spirit went through in that experience. Um, so I just, I think it's really cool. And I, I kind of think that doing this work, with you and me um, is what is honestly kind of enhancing that and bringing that out because I'm looking for that one traumatic instance to try and figure out what happened. So I think that this is kind of an, a skill that's translating into um, my readings um, in kind well, of a know, gentle way. I think what's really interesting is that two readings this week within the past week have been about people leaving their home country in right. favor of another. Right, and Ukraine. Another. Right. When we're yeah. on the, I think what it's over 300,000 people have been displaced so far. Uh, 1.5. Okay. Million. So I was close. I was close. <laughs> the first three days busy. you were close. Yes. The first <laughs> right. three days the of the year. Actually, you were yeah. dead no, off, but, but it's, but yeah. it's, it's horrific. I, I, I don't think that, you know, we've always in the United States been very comfortable being in the United right. States. Yeah. Um, and I don't, it's hard to even imagine, you know, like I can't even fathom 
I cannot even fathom you're living your life. Everything's fine. And then it's as if um, 9-11 is happening in every major city in the United yeah. States yeah. to every building in that major city yeah. in the United States. And um, there's no place to hide. There's no place to hide. And if you're a, a woman or a child, you are definitely a target. And um, when just, you're not supposed to be in theory, a target, right? Like traditionally military, you're not supposed to be, you're not supposed not to be a target. Supposed, yeah. You're not involved in the military, uh, of, right. you know, offensive or, or defensive. Exactly. So Civilian. I mean, it's just, I, God, my stomach just is in knots over this whole thing. Um, and Cindy and I have talked about, um, I believe this will be over. I'm hopeful that this is still accurate timing. Um, I believe this will be over no later than June. I'm hoping for a May resolution, but we have Mercury retrograde in May. So could go either way. Um, yeah, I, God, you know, I stand with Ukraine. I stand with Ukraine. I stand with Ukraine. Um, Putin, fucker. He's just so a fucker. I just, I just think it's interesting that you've had a couple of readings that are about people leaving their homeland and being very afraid in the fleeing. process. Yeah, yeah. Fleeing, fleeing. And because then of, but, because of war actually. Right. And your, yeah. your perception is, is that, well, when people enter another country, they must be so poor or downtrodden that the, that's right. why they're coming. And in reality, it's people like me and you highly yeah. educated, very capable. Yeah. Can, they have to start all over again. Yeah. And with nothing. They arrive nothing. with nothing. Yeah. Can you imagine being our age and arriving in a country with like literally nothing? And like, a, lo- a language barrier on top of it. Yeah, so exactly. Not good. You know? So not to get too political, but I think it's very interesting that you've had two readings uh, within the last week of, of people that in past generations have right. emigrated to another country. Um, right, so. right. And those are the experiences that were brought forward to me. So right. normally it's like the main person steps forward from the other side. And you're right. It is interesting that these individuals that have had those particular experiences are coming forward now to me. Yes to express yeah. this. Um, and I think that's in part to give me a bit, a better, bigger understanding of how traumatic that is, but also then to spread the message to anyone else who wants to listen. Um, and maybe even some who don't, um, so <laughs> Delete. yeah, exactly. So those are my, those are my anecdotes. Um, we'll see what happens in the next, uh, subsequent weeks. I'm really hopeful that I get more of those. Um, and I'm really hopeful that, um, to an extent, I'm really hopeful that this again carries over into our work. It would just give me a more um, clear picture of the moment, moments following abductions or murders. You know, um, I know, but like if we're doing this work, Sandy, like we want resolution, we want bad guys to be named, we want, of course, you know, this isn't like yes, it's entertaining, but it's not just for entertainment. Like there is a little bit of an altruistic um, endeavor here. So, absolutely, yeah. So Absolutely. anyway, all right. It's a fine, it's a fine line to walk, you know, it I is, the fine it really line to walk. is, you know, cause you want to treat this with a little bit of respect and deference. And yet you don't want, you don't want people to be like, I can't listen to it. It's horrible. you know. <laughs> so try yeah, experiencing it, it on our end. So yeah, anyway, yeah. exactly. Or the exactly. poor victim. Um, yeah. Anyway. So the, the case today is about Jody Hosentrude. Um, she is a relatively well-known uh, case. It's it, um, so I'll, I'll just get into it. So Jody was a budding star anchor at the CBS affiliate KIMT TV in Mason City, Iowa, and she disappeared on her way to work on June 27th, 1995. After almost 27 years, police still have very little, little evidence to indicate what happened to Jody and continue to question whether her disappearance was a crime of opportunity or was she targeted by an obsessed fan or perhaps even someone that she knew. The youngest daughter of Maurice and Jane Husentrude, Jody Sue, was born on June 5, 1968, and was raised in Long Prairie, Minnesota. In high school, Jody excelled at golf and helped her team to win the state class eight tournament in both 1985 and 1986. Upon graduation, Jody enrolled at St. Cloud State University, where she studied mass communications and speech communication and secured a starring role on the university's TV station. After obtaining her bachelor's degree in 1990, Jody took a job with Northwest Airlines, but had ambitions to become a famous national news reporter. 
Her education, determination, bubbly personality, and attractive features paved the way for her to begin her broadcasting career with CBS affiliate KGAN in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, as the station's Iowa City Bureau Chief. Shortly thereafter, Jody returned to Minnesota to take a job at ABC affiliate KSAX in Alexandria, and then by 19, uh, November of 1993, at age 25, Jody moved to Iowa to become the TV news anchor for the morning and noon broadcasts of CBS affiliate KIMT in Mason City. Given her early morning schedule, Jody found an apartment about a mile from the downtown news station and moved into the key apartment complex at 600 North Kentucky Avenue. The complex bordered the scenic Winnebago River and East Park, which was abundant with walking trails, local wildlife, and a campground and scenic vistas. The five foot three petite blonde with brown eyes and blonde hair quickly became an active member of the community and a local celebrity, and she was beloved by all that met her. She would often take two hours to do her grocery shopping because she'd have, t- have to take time for all of her fans that kept approaching her. Unfortunately, Jody's dream of making it big ended on Tuesday morning, June 27th, 1995. The anchor of KAMT's 6 a.m. newscast, she usually arrived at the station by 3.30 in the morning. And when it was apparent that she was running late, her producer, Amy Coons, called and woke Jody up at about 4.10 a.m. that morning. Distressed that she'd overslept, Jody promised that she'd be right there. But at 5.30 a.m., with 30 minutes to airtime, Jody had still not arrived, so Amy called her again, but no one answered. By 6 a.m., with no sign of Jody, Amy had no choice but to sit at the anchor desk for the station's daybreak broadcast and deliver the morning news. At the same time, Amy sent a PA over to Jody's apartment to check on her. The police were called at about 7 a.m. as soon as the KIMT staff assistant saw Jody's red Mazda Miata in the parking lot of her apartment complex. Upon arrival, police confirmed that Jody was not in her second floor apartment, but they did discover her red heels, her hair dryer, hairspray, and earrings scattered on the ground near her beloved Miata, which was 12 feet away from the um, building's entrance. Officers also found a bent key inside the lock on the driver's side door, and her driver's side mirror was askew. Drag marks near her car were also visible on the rain-soaked ground, as well as a palm print on her car. Jody's personal items appeared to trail away uh, off from the vehicle, indicating a sign of struggle. Police immediately suspected foul play, as the evidence indicated that Jody had been attacked from behind and forcibly taken while she had approached her car. A search of Jody's apartment revealed two oddities. One, there uh, there were two empty wine glasses near the kitchen sink, and the toilet seat was up in the bathroom as if a man had used the bathroom, indicating that Jody might not have been alone in her apartment the night before she disappeared. Investigators interviewed at least three neighbors in the apartment complex, two of whom said that they had heard screams at about the time that Jody would have been leaving for work, and a third neighbor reported seeing a white Ford Ecoline van parked with its lights on and engine running in the parking lot at about the same time of Jody's disappearance. That van has never positively been identified. By that afternoon, the Mason City Police launched a massive search for Jody, aided by the FBI and the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. Rescue teams scoured the countryside, while divers and police dogs covered the Winnebago River and its banks. No trace of Jody was found. Police also searched Jody's newsroom desk, looking for evidence of a stalker, an angry viewer, or even an obsessed fan. During their review, police revealed that Jody had filed an incident report on October, in October of 1995. Sorry in October of 1994, about being followed by someone in a small white truck while she was out jogging. ABC 2020 recently reported that another female Mason City resident filed a similar report to Jody's about being followed by a small white pickup truck. This resident's report was filed on June 28th, the day after Jody disappeared. By June 29th, investigators had narrowed their focus to about a dozen people for questioning, and on July 1st, the police chief announced that Jody's case was now officially classified as an abduction. Police believed Jody was kidnapped by a single individual, likely one who knew Jody and was familiar with her schedule. However, it is worth noting that on the morning she disappeared, Jody was running very late, by about an hour, so her supposed abductor was kept waiting for quite a while before Jody emerged from her apartment, which was a risky situation for the perpetrator. One of Jody's friends, John Van Sice, claimed that he had been the last person to see Jody alive. At the time, Van Sice was a recently divorced seed salesman who had once briefly lived in Jody's apartment complex. He had befriended Jody and her really close friend, Annie Cruz, when he offered to buy the two women a drink at a bar that they were all patronizing. The trio developed a close friendship that included water skiing off Van Sice's motorboat, 
which he says he had named after Jody, although her name was never actually painted on the boat. Recognizing that he was her, he was 22 years her senior, Van Sys treated Jody like a daughter, someone that he felt very protective of. Two weeks before she disappeared, Van Sys helped Annie throw a surprise birthday party for Jody on June 10th at Sully's Bar in Iowa City. And the weekend before her abduction, June 23rd to the 25th, Jody was away on a water skiing trip to Iowa City with Van Sys, her good friends Annie and Tammy Baker, and Van Sys's son, Trent, who was a college student in, the, in Iowa City at the time. The group had stayed in Trent's apartment, and Tammy and Jody shared a bedroom together. On Monday the 26th, Jody was back at work for what would be her last time. That afternoon, she played in a charity golf tournament where she coincidentally complained to friends that she'd been getting some prank phone calls and joked that she was going to have to change her phone number or go to the police. After the Mason City golf tournament ended, Jody hurried home to change for dinner and returned to the Mason City Country Club to dine with some fellow tournament players. Several witnesses saw Jody leave the club at about 8 o'clock, and her phone records indicate that she was home by 8.26 p.m. and had placed a long-distance phone call to a friend. On that same evening, Van Sice claims that Jody stopped by his home to review the 20-minute videotape taken of her surprise birthday party. Van Sice told police that they were laughing and joking about the edits the two planned to make to the commemorative birthday party video. However, something about Van Sice's account of the evening did not add up with the timeline of Jody's whereabouts on the evening of the 26th. The next day, Jody had disappeared. Although several people suspected Van Sice of having romantic feelings for Jody, Van Sice had no reason to harm her. Further, he had a strong alibi at the time of Jody's abduction because he was out on his daily walk at 6 a.m. with a friend. And in the fall of 1995, he had passed the polygraph test that he was given. In March of 2017, a search warrant was executed against Van Sice seeking GPS data for two of his vehicles. FBI agents were hoping to connect Van Sice's travels to a possible unmarked grave housing Jody's body. Van Sice has repeatedly denied any involvement in Jody's abduction and has never been arrested or charged in connection with her disappearance. Another person of interest, Tony Jackson, captured the attention of police. He was once a promising college basketball player at Iowa's Waldorf College, but he had an unfortunate temper that would quickly escalate into violent encounters. After being dismissed from Waldorf College, Jackson enrolled at North Iowa Community College in Mason City to pursue his interest in broadcasting. At the time, which was a year and a half before Jody's disappearance, Jackson was living in Mason City, two blocks from the KIMT TV station where Jody was employed. Jackson was ultimately arrested in 1997 and then convicted of and sentenced to the equivalent of a life in prison for a series of violent rapes he committed in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Among all of his victims that we know of, there was an element of stalking. Some theorized that Jackson might have watched Jody on TV, had known her schedule, and even stalked her. A former inmate of Jackson's claimed that Jackson had boasted in a rap song about abducting and killing an anchor woman. That particular lead went nowhere, and in May of 1999, the Mason City Police issued the following statement, quote, after conducting a thorough investigation, which included interviews, crime lab analysis, records review, and a polygraph examination, Tony Jackson is not considered at this time a viable sus suspect in the investigation, end quote. <clears throat> Could what was found at the key apartment complex parking lot have something to do with Jody's disappearance? Well, it turns out that her 1991 Miata was not in her name when she vanished. The license was listed to a man named John Lessard. He was the previous owner and it was pending a title transfer. Lessard was a prominent businessman and claimed that the sale was arranged by a friend who was a car salesman. Lessard has been firm that the only time he met Jody was to hand her the car keys. Sadly, the most prominent piece of evidence in Joni's disappearance, her car, was compromised. Detectives processing the scene did not section it off for the first day or so, and then the vehicle was released to her family just a couple of months after she disappeared. So without a car or a body, there really is no crime scene. Perhaps Jody's disappearance is connected instead to the fact that her canvas tote bag, in which she often carried her notebooks and computer diskettes, was not found at the crime scene and has never been located. In April of 2020, investigative journalist Steve Ridge claimed that the notorious Iowa meth drug kingpin, Dustin Honkin, may have been involved in Jody's disappearance. Retired TV anchor and author Beth Bennard shared that Angela Johnson, the girlfriend of Dustin Honkin, worked at the Mason City Country Club where the charity golf tournament that Jody had participated in was held. Honkin and Johnson had allegedly, allegedly been running a drug business at the time of Jody's disappearance. 
It's speculated that if Jody somehow knew about their illegal drug business, the couple would have worried about Jody's ability to expose their operation, and they may have abducted her to silence her. In 2002, Johnson and Honkin were arrested for the murders of five people who had gone missing in 1993. Johnson is currently serving a life sentence, and Honkin, who was sentenced to death row, was executed in July of 2020. In January of 2022, ABC's 2020, lots of 20s, aired an episode about Jody's case and identified a possible suspect, convicted sex offender Thomas Korsgaden. According to his ex-wife, Korsgaden was obsessed with Jody, and at the time of her disappearance, he was in the Mason City area, and he drove a white van, which he dubbed his porn palace. In 2004, police attempted to serve a warrant to gather Korsgaden's palm print to see if it matched the one found on Jody's car. However, when it came time to obtain the print, Korsgaden reportedly became belligerent and refused to cooperate. It's unknown if his prints matched the ones found on Jody's car. However, police have ruled Korsgaden out as a suspect. In the aftermath of this case, on May 14, 2001, six years after Jody's disappearance, she was declared legally dead so that her family could settle her estate. Her father, Maurice, preceded her in death in 1992, and her mother, Jane, died at age 91 in December of 2014. Her two sisters, Joanne Nath and Jill Littow, hoped to discover one day what happened to their younger sister. In 2017, John Van Seis disclosed that he had early onset Alzheimer's and he would no longer provide statements or commentary regarding Jody's disappearance. In 2003, journalists Gary Peterson and Josh Benson created the website findjody.com. Jody's disappearance prompted one of the largest manhunts in Iowa history. Police and private investigators have conducted more than 1,000 interviews but none has resulted in any conclusive evidence pointing to a suspect. Beyond some DNA samples and the palm print, police have not been forthcoming about what additional, if any, evidence that they have. The story about her abduction has been featured on several national television programs, including America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, 2020, Nancy Grace, Psychic Detectives, 48 Hours, and numerous other talk shows. Jody's case continues to be an active and ongoing investigation by the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation and the Mason City Police Department, led by lead investigator Terrence Prochaska. My sources for this story included Wikipedia, CBS News 48 Hours, Jody Hosentrue Mystery uh, by Jim Axrod, July 18, 2020, Iowa Cold Cases, Jody Sue Hosentrue, Case Summary by Jody Ewing, Unsolved Mysteries Wiki, first airing February 18, 1996. In Touch Weekly, Up and Vanished uh, by Emma Hernandez, February 15, 2020, Mason City Daily Reporter, June 29, 1995, and ABC's 2020, episode 44, Gone at Dawn, January 28, 2022, by Amy Roback and Maria Oz. So what do you think happened, Dee? Um, what was interesting, um, because as I was reading it, it through, normally when I'm reading your cases through sands and there's a suspect that um is listed it's almost like their name kind of comes at me like oh this guy right it's like pretty immediate um and in this case i just kept going no 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 um so i don't think that anybody listed here actually did the deed at all um although so i'm just going to read the automatic writing that i wrote okay um, and it's, um, automatic writing tends to be a little bit on the flowery side. Um, so it's not like, um, how we would write to each other. Okay. It's a little bit more, um, like almost, um, sing song poetic or sing. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, uh, yes, dear, we are here to tell you of the fate of dear Jody, a star to your side whose starlight was, uh, snuffed out by a man of evil deeds. She, our girl, Jody was taken away in the ambulance, which I thought was really interesting because um, it was a white van, um, and brought to the woods some miles away from her big sister city. Jody's form in your world was killed quickly, but she does still remember the deed and the details. She was quite undone at first by the end uh, to her beginning, but now she is filled with joy and love. She visits with her, her oldest sister often and looks out from her photo on the table. I have no idea if uh, Jody's older sister has a photo of Jody on the table, but that's what came through. You ask us who did the deed, a man unknown to Jody, not a man of wealth or reputation, but a man of deep, dark trouble. We think his name was Leonard. And what was interesting was when you were reading it and there's Lessard, right? But I, I just didn't, um, 
I just didn't feel that lesser was the one. I don't know. I could be wrong, but it, I didn't feel it was lesser. Um, where was I? Uh, uh, Leonard. And he took a fancy to dear Jody. He was in the van that scurried her away. He bound her with tape and struck her cruelly until she fell, uh, fell silent again. She was sent back to us the same day she was taken, gone before um, any of you there had noticed. Jody is true indeed now helping um, those who come their way uh, to her by like manner indeed. So she is on the other side, she's assisting women who have been raped and murdered. So she's helping them trend, um, in, their trans in the transition. Um, you ask us what has become of Leonard. He is still with you on your plane, uh, but too old now to be of concern. We do not think Jody's murder will ever uh, be solved as the police have searched in all the wrong places, but Jody will come through again soon enough. Uh, and she is already on the plan for another go. In other words, um, she's gonna reincarnate. So she's already working on um, what I call blueprint. So her next life. Um, so uh, that's what came through. Um, I think that this guy is still out there. Um, I think that he has only murdered Jody. I don't believe he's a serial killer. Um, and uh, Sans, as you and I were talking, when I was trying to sort of feel him out, um, <clears throat> I think that he saw Jody as sort of the perfect person to grab because she was small and she was accessible, it was easy to get to her. Um, she, I think, liked people so much that she was very naive about who was around her. Um, and uh, Vances, I never thought did, uh, had any part to do with her disappearance at all. However, I think that the wine glass, uh, the two wine glasses the night before, I, I think he lied about where they watched the videotape because I, that I think that it just would have been too suspicious for him. So I believe that he was like, yeah, we watched it at my place. I, I'm not buying that. I think that because the timeline, they've made a lot, a big deal about the timeline. Um, mm -hmm. if she left the golf course dinner at 8, 8 PM, which is when people saw her leaving. Mm -hmm. And she made that long distance phone call at 8 26 PM. Mm -hmm. There would have been no way for her to drive realistically to Van Sice's apartment or right. wherever he was living, watch right. a 15 minute video and right. get home in time for that 826. Right. So that's why the police have continually be, been investigating yeah. him because he, he, the timeline didn't line up with what right. was reported. Right. And so I think his anxiety and his nervousness made him compulsively lie. Mm -hmm. And then now he can't go back on the lie because really he's one of the, he's one of the most suspicious characters because he spent so much time with her. And I don't think people really understood their relationship. From my perspective, it was very avuncular. I think he thought she was adorable and pretty. And I think if she had been open to having some sort of a relationship with him, I don't know that he would have acted on it because there was this sort of distance. Um, you know, I don't see you that way kind of thing. I think that you are attractive. I like being around you. I, it was almost like when I kind of hopped into that energy, it was almost like if only she was 20 years older and from her perspective, if only he was 20 years younger kind of thing. Um, Cause they did get along. I feel like there was a lot of chemistry there. It just wasn't necessarily sexual. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I believe that he was in her apartment the night before, but again, that would have cast him into um, a really suspicious light that he didn't quite know how to get out of. If well, he let me also it. just add this. He showed up at the crime scene and was like, and was, as you say, high energy, anxious saying mm -hmm. I was the last person to see her alive. Mm -hmm. And then he was trapped because mm -hmm. he was admitting that he was with her, right. but the timeline wasn't fitting based on what he was telling them. Right. So it just kept, unfortunately his getting away from decision, Yeah. Unfortunately his decision to try and not make, put himself in the reign of suspicion so that they would look at the right person, not the right. wrong person, him. Right. It right. made it even worse, worse. because yeah. he was tripping up on himself in terms of for what sure. he had to say. For so. sure, for sure. So <clears throat> with her killer, this, I, and I don't know if Leonard is right or not. If I'm going to be wrong on anything, it's going to be names. Names are just not, they don't come easily to me, but that is the name that my hand wanted to write. So um, with him, I feel like she was um, a one and only um, murder. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like uh, when he was done, 
when he, after he'd murdered her and I feel like he buried her in the woods. And I kept getting this feeling like a tug Southwest. And if you go from, um, Cedar Rapids, right. Is where she was. Oh, to, Mason city, Mason city. Sorry. If you go from Mason city, Southwest there, there's a lot of like open woodsy kind of area. And, um, I, I feel like she will never be found ever because she's not near anything, not near a trail, not near anything. I think that he just took her into the woods. She's fairly light and, um, raped her, murdered, murdered her and buried her. And he did it pretty quickly. I don't think that he lingered. Um, and, um, I feel like he had the duct tape already in the back of the van. Um, and he had the shovel, he had everything, he had every intention of abducting her, every intention of raping her, every intention of, um, murdering her and then burying her afterwards. He was fully prepared. So he was likely in that Ford Econoline van that was sitting in the parking lot. That oh yeah, that was him. That she, that was yeah, him. for sure. That was him. Um, and it's interesting how it came out as like the ambulance because it's like the, the white looking, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ambulance looking thing. Um, and I think after he was done, um, I feel like he thought it was a lot of anxiety for not a lot of pleasure and a lot of, um, he felt dirty, not from an emotional standpoint, but from a physical standpoint, um, he felt like there was blood on him. There was dirt on him and he just kind of, um, ugh, it grossed him out. So he had no intention after that of ever repeating it. I think he was expecting something else. And the reality just didn't meet what his fantasy was, was going to be. So you had said, when we were talking about this earlier, you had said, oh, he saw her as a human. And that's why he thought it was dirty. And he never saw her as a, as a human. He never saw her as a human. Um, there was no intention ever of like actually seeing her. This was just, I want to do this thing. I'm going to do this thing. This is how I'm going to do this thing. Um, so yeah, I think he's still kind of out there. Honestly, I think he's still out there. Um, but I, I also feel like he's in his late sixties, early seventies. So, um, and you said you didn't think he was in good health at this point. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't feel he's long for this world. Honestly, you know, I think that he's in declining health big time. Um, he feels like he's a smoker. Cause I can kind of like, you know, there's a, that almost like ashtray taste yeah. when you're around smokers. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I pick that up a lot and I, um, pick up that, um, he's not really a man of, um, any significant wealth at all. Um, so he might be living in, you know, kind of a, a low rent, um, location. Um, I don't think he had any family. It doesn't feel like he's connected to anyone. He just feels like he's just this, you know, forgotten guy. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my impression. Um, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but that, that's my impression. So um, that's my story. I'm sticking to it kind of thing. Okay. So, but it's, it's so like, on the one hand, it's so sad that I don't feel her murder will ever be solved because I don't think they'll ever find her body. And certainly this guy isn't going to confess. I don't think that he, he might've stalked her um, for like three days. That was the impression I had that he stalked her for about three days, but he didn't write to her. He didn't um, call her. He didn't make himself known at all because um, I feel like he wasn't that guy that wanted to show off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't have the narcissistic personality that you find in a lot of serial killers. Um, so um, I think he just kept it quiet. I don't think he ever told anybody um, that he was taken with her or fascinated with her. And I really didn't feel like the couple who was the guy that called the, the man his porn palace or whatever? Yeah, Cascaden. Yeah, I just of course, that, of course, of course, Caden, I think is his name. Yeah, it just didn't like that would have been to me because all of the other stuff kind of fit, right? So that mm -hmm. would have been to me like, oh, maybe this guy really did do it. And mm -hmm. when I try and place him in that situation, it bounces back. So it just, I don't feel it's him. Um, I just well, don't. The police have also ruled him out for whatever reason. So yeah. his palm print might not have matched yeah. that on the, on the van. Yeah. I um, think his girlfriend lied, honestly. I think she of lied. Of course. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that unfortunately it's such a high profile case, you know, yeah. a news anchor disappeared yeah. on her way to work one morning. Right. And right. so there's, there are a lot of resources continuing to 
keep her story alive in hopes of solving the crime yeah. or the mystery. And I, you know, it makes me sad that it, that it won't see justice, at yeah. least from your perspective. I hope I'm time. wrong. I hope yeah. I'm wrong. I hope someday that it is solved. I hope that this guy makes a deathbed con- confession from what I can pick up of his energy. He ain't never going to do it. He just won't. Well, I also really am encouraged to know that Jody, who, who really did want to make a difference in this world and very positive, she's very involved in the community. And, yes. you know, she's continuing to kind of do that yeah. work on, on the, and that's side. so her personality too, right? Yeah. Like she was, um, I feel like she was a woman who felt lucky, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. She put in the hard work. Um, yes. She, um, you know, persevered probably in the face of, of rejections now and then. Um, but I feel like she gravitated toward people who were struggling. I feel like she really wanted to connect with people. And so this job that she's got on the other side, where she's working with women who are raped and murdered, um, you know, kind of bringing them across and helping them understand where they are and what happened to them and acclimating them to their new environment. Um, that's like tailor made a tailor made job for her, Mm -hmm. honestly. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I didn't really, I can't say I touched her. I can't say she, she didn't come forward to me at all. Um, I didn't really ask her to come forward, honestly. Um, I just asked for clarity and answers. Um, so I can't say that I talk, spoke to her. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I can give you a sense of like how I feel like her energy still radiates. So, um, from my perspective, it's a job that, um, really suits her well. And she does very well. So good. I think she's doing a lot of good on the other side. Yeah. I think she would have done good regardless of where she ended up. Right. It's just really tragic right. that she didn't get to finish what she had planned right. to do here. Right. Um, but I think, I think what's encouraging is that the person you are here is, is the person you are there. Yeah. You are there. And yeah. if you have s- stuff to work out, then right. you spend time over there working it out. To- right kind of right. evolve to be the person you're supposed to be. Right. Well, or you know, repeat the lesson here. It, it, it's so interesting you bring this up, Sans, because I, I literally had a reading last night where um, a woman's grandfather came through and um, he gave me a very distinct impression that when he was here on this side, he had been a bigoted, um, you know, black and white kind of character, was very hard on his kids. Um, I believe that there was someone who was on the LBGTQ spectrum in his family, and he'd been particularly cruel to them. And um, one of the very first things that he showed me was black and white, you know, mm-hmm. like I thought life was black and white. I thought, you know, men were with women, women were with men, and there was none of this other stuff. And then he went, but now, and there was this rainbow, he like waved his hand and this rainbow oh, appeared, wow. right? Mm-hmm. And so he's like, I get it. I get it. I understand. Love is love is love is love. Right. And then he went even one step further. Cause I, this guy in life was not a likable person, but on the other side, um, it's almost like he'd gone through an enlightenment. Right. And so he went one step further and he starts throwing rainbow confetti in the air. <laughs> like, like, love is love love is love yeah, um yeah. and um he ended you know it was a very moving reading actually because his main goal in coming through um and my client was very surprised actually that he came through because she was like you know um he would have been the last person i would have thought would come through and i said well it was so important for him to come through because he wanted to let his son know that he understood his son mm-hmm. finally that he didn't understand him in life and he might have stifled his growth in life and um, he sees him clearly on the other side and there's just nothing but love, love um, for his son and acceptance, acceptance too. Um, and um, he kept pressing upon me to tell my client, please tell your father, please tell your father that his dad came through and had this message. And um, the other interesting thing was this, this grandfather figure also had a daughter and he was even worse with her, harder on her. And um he indicated to me um, that he had a daughter. I asked my client, she confirmed she has an aunt on that side. And uh, he said, um, hold this message. And if there's ever a time that you feel my daughter is able to hear it, tell her. He said, but right now she's not. And my client was like, yeah, no, she doesn't want to hear from him at all. So like, I get it, right? I get it. It may be something that when she crosses over, they have to work out um, together um, if she's willing you know, if she's willing, 
but um, from his perspective, oh my God, like I never get emotional um, when I'm pulling people in from the other side. Um, if I get emotional, it's because my client is in such a, such a terribly dark place and it's empathy, but like from the other side, I'm like, I don't wear those emotions. He got me emotional. He got me emotional because he was so remorseful. He was so ashamed of what he'd done. So his personality was still his personality, but he, he now understood. So it had kind of transformed the, um, the denial, the, you know, limited view of the world, the bigotry, the probably racism was probably in there as well. Um, and, um, he was like, you know, he <laughs> saw the light, <laughs> literally he saw yeah. the light. So, um, yeah, but your personality does carry over. Um, it absolutely carries over. So there's hope for people that we know that, um, we have a love for, but that aren't <sighs> evolved, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, you know, woke, <laughs> um, or, you know, super stuck in their opinion of the world when, um, it's a very limited view. So there's hope, um, that when you cross, you kind of get it. You know, I figure like if this guy who came through last night, who came through, um, and can be so difficult and so set in his ways here, cause he definitely made me feel like he didn't, he didn't even entertain the idea of any other form of um, love other than man to woman, woman to man. And on the other side, um, he just embraced it. He yeah. just was like, yes, I'm, you know, I, I'll, wa I'll walk in the parade with, you know, my relative, whoever it is. Um, so, and throw confetti. <laughs> well, I think, I think confetti. love has tremendous priority over on the other side. You yeah. Know? So yeah, if you look at does. everything always from a loving perspective, right. then all of your narrow viewpoints or all of the things that cause us to be angry or hateful or yeah. upset doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So well put scenes. So well put. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Okay. So speaking of well put, um, thank you for your perspective on today's case. It's well, one that for, has, thank mm -hmm. you for doing such an extensive job on this. Like this was awesome. Way to go. Um, for next week, we're going to, um, similarly to the way in which we, uh, addressed, um, oh my God, I can't think of their names. Forgive me, please. The two women in Hawaii, um, Lisa Ao and Diane Suzuki, where we combine two. Like you're asking together. me, the woman who doesn't get names, doesn't remember names. Yeah. I'm like, uh. Well, I mean, we're throwing out. Uh, yeah. So we talked about both of them in the same podcast right, and right. we're going to do the same thing next week. We're going to talk about, um, two unrelated, but related cases, Tiffany sessions and Jennifer Kessie, both of Florida, both women disappeared with no idea what happened to either woman. It was not that it was committed by the same perpetrator, but because of these two cases and the, um, aggressive ac actions on both families, parts, to raise awareness around these cases in 2008, the Florida House of Representatives unanim unanimously passed a Senate bill number 502, which is called the Jennifer Kessie and Tiffany Sessions Missing Persons Act, which was designed to reform how missing person cases are handled in Florida. So I will be curious to hear after sharing their respective stories, what your impressions are of what happened to these beautiful women. Yeah. Um, Hopefully I can get something. I'm, yes. I'm waiting for the time when like nothing, like I'm so fearful of it, but I, but hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to at least, you know, if there's not something on one, hopefully there'll be something on the other. So we'll see. We'll see. And I know you're going to do a beautiful job writing it up and give me lots to go on. So that's always great. Okay. So until next week, thank you everyone. Do, 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 do. I love for you listening. Scene. I love you. <laughs> now promote love yourself, love Victoria. Is love. love is love. For, I love you. For, for more information about Victoria, you can go to victorialaurie.com. Laurie is spelled L E U R I E. If you'd like to book an appointment or look at um, any of the books I've written, um, you go there, victorialaurie.com. So that's it. That's it, guys. All right. We got through it. Happy Friday. Unless you're listening to this on an, another day of the week, then happy day of that. Um, and Sandy, thank you again. I love you so much. Thank you. And, love you too. Uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds All right. Great. Bye guys. Bye everyone. Bye.
Bye.